Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm Hillary. And I'm Lark. And we all work together at the National Women's Law Center. Welcome to Hearsay, where we deep dive into cultural moments that live rent free in our heads and probably yours too. And today, it's Britney, bitch. We are talking about Miss Britney Jean Spears. I feel like, again, this is an episode I could have talked for days and days and days about. We're specifically talking about her conservatorship, the state of conservatorships in our country, and what, where we're at, where we're going, what her impact has been in that space. But I feel like first we have to get to where we were first introduced to the icon that is Britney Spears. To the legend. To the legend herself. I mean, I was pretty young, I think, when she debuted, when Hit Me Baby One More Time came out. I remember, like, I couldn't have this, the CD, but my aunt had the CD, and I would go to her house and <laughs> play it on her, like, 12-CD boombox. Mm. Um, I specifically remember asking for the You Drive Me Crazy Barbie that had, like, the green lame crop top and <laughs> dance pants. I did get it, and I'm sure it's still in my parents' basement somewhere. Um, I had, like... Did you guys remember Hit Clips? I don't think you had Hit Clips. What hit, hit Clips? clips? Hit it. Coming at you right between the ears is Hit Clips. Music to get you grooving. They were like a precursor to MP3 players. They were so cool. They were these little keychains, and you plugged in what kind of looks like an SD card, and it would play just like 90 seconds. Monster sound. And so they had... 90 seconds. Yeah. That's a hit, crazy. A, clip, a hit clip. Like was, it's giving tooth tunes. Yes. Yes. That's literally <laughs> what it was. It was like before we got iPods, um, before we got MP3 players, my hit clips. I'm still mad I don't have those still, but I had tons of Britney hit clips. Um, I just... I've always been a fan. My mom has always been a fan. My mom is followed by her on Twitter. Wait, what? Yeah. Which is so weird because... How did that happen? Huh? My mother... The influencer that she is was one of the, like, first people on Twitter. Like, her work was, like, you need to be on this for work. And she was, like, don't think so, but sure. And that was when, <laughs> like, you know, there was, like, a couple thousand people on Twitter and everyone followed each other. And the official Britney Spears account still to this day follows my mother. Um, you were destined. I'll Your never, mother, also an icon. Yeah, also yeah. an icon. And I'll never let her live that down. But, yeah, I feel like I've been lifelong. I don't know about you guys. So I, you know, a little older than Britney. And so when she debuted, um, you know, I was still in, like, still sort of an MTV watcher. I was coming home from college. <laughs> I was in the later years of college. And um, I had a summer temp job at an adhesives company, which is another oh. funny story for another day. In the accounting department, it was a really big special I mean, it was basically the office. I, like, worked in the <laughs> office. I'm not... I'm not, no part of that is an exaggeration, but, um, you know, it was a summer job and I was like in my hippie clothes and everyone else was like, it just, none of it worked out. But I remember driving to lunch and the song came on and it was like on the, my brain was split in that moment of like one hand, this is catchy as hell. A bop. Like, Banger. yeah, exactly. On the other hand, this poor child, look yeah. what they're doing to her, right? Like what she's in this like schoolgirl outfit mm -hmm. and like the pink puffs in her hair mm -hmm. and the whole thing. And I was like, this isn't Okay. Like this, this is a little girl and they're making her sexy, but then having her look like a kid right. and like, why is no one upset about this? Won't someone save Britney? What I've discovered recently is that I'm only four years older than Britney Spears. That's... And like this like paternalistic, like wanting to protect her <laughs> right. thing, like wasn't any better maybe than, you know, the, well... than the exploitation on, on the front end of, mm. of the start of her career. But, um, yeah, it's like, so I think my entire relationship since then, you know, Britney shaves her head, Britney, Justin mm -hmm. Timberlake, J Britney, everything was like, won't someone save Britney? Mm -hmm. Won't someone protect Britney? I've just like been worried about her my whole life as if she's so much younger than me, but, but she's like, not. you probably have seen people you've grown up with or like, I don't know. I don't want to make an assumption, but it's like, even those few years, like, I mean, right. my cousins are, like, four years younger than me. And mm -hmm. if I saw something like that or just anything, I'm, like, I'm yeah. overprotective, but I'm, like, I was just. Well, the difference between age. college and high school, too. Yeah. Right? Like, I thought I was so old. Years. And now yeah. I realize, like, you know, I mean, her kids are older than my kids. Like, it's. Wow, that's crazy to think about. Yeah. We like, both have boys, though. Yeah. Oh. Just the same. Same. Me and Brittany Jean. <laughs> <laughs> You've been linked. Yeah. Both of y'all have been linked yeah. for life. We have personal um, connections. Mine wasn't as. My link was not. As I don't know, private present. <laughs> I feel like um, I like I kind of always knew of her. My mom was a like 
big like 90s 2000s mm -hmm. radio person in addition to all the Woman many music heart. yeah um all the other music that she listened to and I was very online in mm -hmm. like my late like elementary school oh my God. through middle school <laughs> years so I was very familiar with leave Britney alone mm -hmm. and how fucking dare anyone out there make fun of Britney after all she's been through leave Britney alone and the Britney Britney episode of Glee oh, was amazing. Changed the game. It, it, it is a pivotal moment in yeah. my life. Like the <laughs> every, I think every, because I was probably one of their, they had just blown a bag on that yeah. episode with like the costumes All and like, their the recreation. Episodes. But the like that star too. Yeah. The fact that she was in the yes. episode is unbelievable. I was, gooped. I was like, yeah. Because I, I think I was so grasping like celebrity cameos. Right. I'm like, right. is she, is, does she know she's doing this? Does and she that's know Brittany. she's here? She's everywhere. Um, and Jessica, I know you, we were at a work conference over the summer and we were like getting into our Britney lore and we were at karaoke and oh. it was like truly the millennial Gen Z divide. There was like, what, six of us on the team, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think we were like three millennial, three Gen Z. And we were like, well, we should sing Britney. Like, what song should we sing? And someone got up and sang Lucky, I believe, right? And, and I had no idea what song it yeah, was. Yeah, you <laughs> and every other Gen Z person on the team and me and the other millennials were like, what? Like, know your history. You have to watch Lucky. And then like two seconds later, I was like, well, if you listen to Lucky and watch that music video now, like yeah. post Free Britney, you will be like, what the hell did you guys not know? Like what was so shocking about, about the, every, like this, she's telling it for us. Yeah. 20 years ago. That was like her second album, right? Yeah. Or something like right away. I don't know right who away. wrote that song for her, but they said, here's your life, Brittany. Yep. It's sad. Yeah. We knew it was sad at the time, right? Watching it felt sad. You knew from the debut it was sad. It, it felt exploitative at, yeah. at a minimum. And you felt like she was being used out mm -hmm. of the gate. And she it's was. a machine, right? Yeah. Like she came out of Mickey Mouse Club mm -hmm. and the same, do you, do you remember like making the band? Like yep. they would like oh, turn shows and, and making that, the band. that creepy dude. Lou Who's Pearlman. That? Yeah, wow, awful, you had his awful, name awful. right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, right. Like we knew it was a machine even while we were consuming it mm -hmm. from the start that this was like, she was produced for, for a very specific purpose to make mm -hmm. a lot of people money. Kind of my generation's version of that in my head would be like Demi Lovato, Miley mm -hmm. Cyrus, and like mm -hmm. Selena Gomez because they were all on Barney. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think. Yeah. I don't know if Miley was, but I know Selena and Demi were yeah. on Barney. Together. I remember reading like the teen magazines mm -hmm. about like how they grew up together and da-da-da-da. Mm -hmm. I think Selena um, has had a quote-unquote more like normal life, I guess, mm -hmm. since like being a child star, but like Demi, they have been through a lot yeah. and as has Miley too and I think Miley's kind of figuring out what she wants for her mm -hmm. life, but we have clearly seen, like, I don't know why it's seemingly, like, we are recreate trying to recreate the same kind of virality, the same mm -hmm. kind of stardom over and over again, starting with Michael Jackson, going mm -hmm. to Britney Spears, going right. to, like, look at this amazing child. Right. We're all just still grooving and dancing, yeah. and it's like, well... And ruining their lives. And ruining right. their lives. Yeah. And it's like right. the sacrifice of one person for the enjoyment of millions. Mm -hmm. All the people around her, like, that's what I kept thinking when I read her memoir was, like, She's doing a Vegas residency. She's on, right. was it X Factor, Ameri America's Got Talent. She's on How I Met Your Mother. She's on Glee. She's on, and no one in all of these times, Thought everyone to... everyone was complicit with it. Everyone yeah. just said, oh, yep, that's fine. That's what she's supposed to do. She's and, there to make us money. Right, mm -hmm. right. And that's what I'm, we're, we'll get into this later, but we will be talking to Mayanna Nafi, our esteemed colleague, um, who wrote a fabulous, fabulous report about um, conservative ships and forced sterilization in the United States, which I think I personally did not know was like still a legal thing in so many states. Um, but they have done a lot of important work on it. And I'm really interested to hear their take on the policing of your actions in your life. You know, like I think it's very specific to women too. Yeah, that, true. That like we want them as girls mm -hmm. and we want them to be a certain way. And I really feel like when everyone turned on Britney was when Obviously, like, she breaks up. She and Justin Timberlake break up. But also, then she has kids. Mm -hmm. And that, and suddenly she's, like, not the ingenue anymore. Mm -mm. She's not, she's, like, broken. You know, mm -hmm. and everyone was obsessed with her virginity. I remember it that, too. It was so gross. It was so gross, right? And, like... Like, the clips of, like, Diane Sawyer, like, <gasps> drilling yeah. into this teenage girl. It's Right. So, horrific. first she's, like, a bad girl. Mm -hmm. And then she's a bad mom. They mm -hmm. say she's not fit, like, for her kids. And then, you know... Like late now, she's like 
an icky mom because she's like showing her body and right. proud of herself. They, there was never a way Britney Spears was ever going to win. No, she was. She was never going. To, there was like no right way for her to be in the mm-hmm. world. And and like you know, we can get into this a little bit. Um, having just like I went through her book in mm-hmm. preparation for this, and it is like it's what was hardest for me reading it is how much she. I don't think realized, you know, because it was it was her life. Right. But she didn't realize what had been taken from mm-mm, her mm-mm. In, until it was very literally taken from her when yeah. the conservatorship started. Her father started it and literally took her from her kids. And mm-hmm. everything she did there was to get them back. Mm-hmm. It's like heartbreaking. And even but even now she says in there, it was like it was 13 years to to get my family mm-hmm. back, to get to be free, like in that time period. That's that's like a third of her life right. mm-hmm. I- imprisoned because because she you know had the audacity to try to be a person. Right. It's like it's so sick. Yeah. And I just I know the whole. I mean, there's a reason I feel like that part stuck out in the media from her memoir. I feel like it's one of like the most talked about parts is her having an IUD and not being able to have it removed when she wants to have more children, and that. I feel like resonated with people a lot because that was a very concrete way for people to see the control. Right. Right. To see, wow, yeah, something as simple as me going to the doctor or making this choice. And but I still don't think people are connecting that to like other ways we have coercive control in the country because it's like reproductive health. As us, like and when you think about like when you're like a kid or even as like a young adult, like if you have relationships with your family and you're like, oh like I like I don't know what choice to make, you kind of still have an influence in like what you want to do. But it's literally like a she had no agency. No. And it's like and it's not she's not the only person in the world in the country that has been in that situation. Right. Right. And we there could be people that we know and talk to. Yeah, well, and I yeah. like yeah. before Britney Spears' whole story came out. I don't, I didn't even know conservatorships existed. I didn't know that was a thing that could happen to you or be put upon you or that you could put on someone. I feel like I still don't understand conservatorships, and I'm really excited to hear your conversation with Mayan so mm-hmm. I can learn more. I I've read Mayan's forced sterilization mm-hmm. report that they wrote, and it's amazing. But there's there's so much beyond that, and Britney is a small you know, is a well-resourced person mm-hmm. um, who was so harmed by this that I, mm-hmm. I, I imagine those without resources, like, it goes much further. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, Brittany's freed, but she won't really ever be free because she's been so messed up mm-hmm. by right. this whole situation. I don't know how you trust anything no. again. No. You know, after your family calls the cops on you. Right. And, and after your children are taken away. Like, the trauma that has been inflicted on her— mm-hmm. All because she grew up, like, right. and became mm-hmm. a person, right, like, yeah. became an adult, and they couldn't control her anymore. Like, it's so depressing. It's so I, awful. I mean, we could do a little, like, who's the worst person in Britney Spears' life Her game. father. Jamie Spears. Okay. Evil. Yeah. Evil, you're, you're, evil man. Yeah. There was an interesting—this is a total tangent, um, but an interesting article, I think it was in New York Magazine, about Jamie, her father's mother, and essentially— Jamie, the men in Jamie's family have done this to the women in their lives for generations. Oh my like, gosh. there is a, there's a, at least I think a three generation history of men in his family, um, like institutionalizing the women yeah. they were involved with or their mothers and stuff like that. So it's like trauma upon trauma. And is. this is what you get. And when it's unhealed and untouched, and then you throw in like corruption, money, power, mm-hmm. and like, you know, they, Brittany in her book talks so much about the like I wanted to sing and I wanted to perform Mm -hmm. and like the costs of that like I I don't think she sees them Mm -mm. even to the degree that and and that again is so sad to me like I I didn't I I read it I don't know if Michelle Williams somehow makes it like feel cheerier I doubt it in the the audio version Mm -hmm. but it is um it is it is uh, heartbreaking. A, heartbreaking, and to watch someone who has given so much to so many people, and all she ever wanted to do was give things yeah. to mm-hmm. people, and still like that yeah. was that her whole life. She says that, that as a kid, she's still like that, and I think that made me the most angry. I guess fired up yeah. about that. Even after all of this, she's which still I not completely like, right, jaded. which I yeah. think it would be hard because it's it's understanding and accepting that every single person you've ever encountered (laughs) since you were 16 has been complicit in 
imprisoning you, taking away your rights, and being in control of you. And Mm -hmm. that, I think, obviously would be a very hard pill to swallow. And so I think she probably only has capacity to be angry at certain people for a certain amount of time. But Mm -hmm. to me, it's like every single person, every driver of the car, you know, every Mm -hmm. wardrobe person, every guest host and everything else of all these shows she was on, they're all complicit. Yeah. Yeah. Q Lucky. I'm so excited to talk with Maya Nanafi, who is a senior counsel here at the National Women's Law Center, an incredible disability justice advocate and a proud member of the disability community. I'm so excited to talk with them about their work, about um, the impact their work has had, and just I have a lot of questions for them. So how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. Thanks. Um, I guess we'll just jump right on in. Um, We'll get a little bit deeper into one of my favorite reports we have ever done at the Law Center, which is your report, um, in a little bit. But I want to know a little bit more about what brought you to this body of work and kind of to this moment right now. So in terms of the forced sterilization laws, um, I knew that there were laws out there that explicitly allow the forced sterilization of disabled people, but I didn't know how widespread they were. I knew they existed, but it felt really troubling that no one was talking about it. Like the story that we're told about forced sterilization, if we're told the story at all, is that it's something that was confined to this dark period in history. And, you know, there was certainly state-sanctioned forced sterilization on a massive scale um, during the 20th century, and that disproportionately impacted women of color, disabled women, poor women. But the reality is also that state laws explicitly allowing the forced sterilization of disabled people exist right now to Day, not just in a handful of states, but in the majority of them. So in our study, in the report that you mentioned, we found that 31 states and D.C. have these laws in place right now. And these laws aren't just relics from history. These aren't laws that were passed 100 years ago. Some laws were actually passed as recently as 2019. So the goal of the report was really to bring these laws to light and to try to change the way that we talk about forced sterilization. Those are wild numbers. I is just so startling and staggering to hear. Like you said, I think a lot of people think of that as something in the past, but it's actively happening right now. And I think for a lot of us, you know, what brought our consciousness to this conversation about conservatorships, guardianships, forced sterilization and other forms of really just revoked bodily autonomy um, was Britney Spears being kind of pretty public with her case. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that connection, right? You, I know your report talks a lot about what is considered a conservatorship in some states, what is considered guardianship, how forced sterilization is not necessarily tied but connected, and kind of all these words and concepts that we've been unfortunately um, introduced to recently. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people were really shocked to learn about guardianship or conservatorship when when Britney Spears' experience came to light, but it's actually a lot more common than people realize. So just to zoom out a little bit, um, guardianship is a system where a judge appoints someone to make decisions on your behalf. And different states have different terminology. California calls it conservatorship, but guardianship is sort of a more common term across various states, so I'll mostly use that. And one estimate from a few years back is that something like 1.3 million people are under guardianship or have active guardianship cases, and that is almost certainly an undercount. Um, This is a system that is massively overused and abused. Many people are funneled into guardianship as just sort of a matter of course, just based on the assumption that they can't make their own decisions in their life, when in reality there are a lot of alternatives to guardianship that preserve people's autonomy and preserve their basic rights. And once you're under guardianship, it's really hard to get out of it. So it took Britney Spears something like, what, like 13 years to get out of guardianship? And if Britney Spears, who is white and wealthy and famous, wasn't able to claim control over her rights for so long, that just gives us a hint of what people who don't have those privileges might have to go through. 
And guardians are often given um, sweeping powers over people's lives. So people might lose many of their most basic rights when they're placed under guardianship. And that sometimes can include things like um, the right to get married and to vote and see their children, to where they live and who they can associate with and how to spend their money. And they can lose the rights to make decisions about um, what health care they get. And that can include reproductive care like birth control and abortion, and it can include permanent sterilization. So the four sterilization laws um, at, that, that I talked about earlier, um, they don't only affect people under guardianship. So in many states, disabled people who aren't under guardianship can be forced to be sterilized as well. But people who are under guardianship are and, uh, or at risk of being under guardianship are, are likely disproportionately impacted by these laws. So there's a lot of overlap and overall hauling the guardianship system has to be a part of the strategy for tackling these forced sterilization laws as well. Yeah. I mean, that's so interesting. I, I like that you pointed out how it kind of snowballs and affects so many parts of your life and, you know, bringing up the fact that Britney Spears is one of the most famous and identifiable people probably on the globe. And she had such a hard time. I read her memoir that came out in 2023. And it's interesting in that, too. She, you know, obviously is very honest and open with the harm that has been put upon her. Um, but I think coming into that book after reading your work, it doesn't feel like she's quite there on being an advocate for overhauling the system as a whole, right? She takes this point of view of here I am, like you said, a quote unquote, normal, white, straight, really rich woman. Um, and they did this to me. And I was doing all these seemingly visually functional, quote, normal things. And that's really just a dangerous line, right? That's a dangerous way of thinking. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about some of the misconceptions and, um, really kind of harmful ways of thinking when we talk about this, of who we deem as a society allowed to be victimized and coerced in this way. Right. Absolutely. I think that there is this idea that there are some disabled people um, or people with certain types of disabilities that can't make their own decisions or shouldn't be making their own decisions. And so guardians need to step in for their own good. Like there's this, this widespread idea that guardianship is somehow this benevolent system that's there to protect disabled people from themselves. But as disabled people, you know, people across all types of disabilities, we can make our own decisions. Even if we need particular supports to do that, um, we have every right to make our own decisions. And even if others don't think the decision that we're making is the right one. And a system that forces people under guardianship takes away that dignity to have a say over your life and your body and your future. And that system, as I mentioned, needs massive overhaul. But a lot of supporters of Britney Spears have sort of stopped short of saying that, of, of questioning the guardianship system as a whole. So some have suggested um, that, you know, some people should be under guardianship and like people with certain types of disabilities or certain types of support needs. But Britney Spears is not like those people, you know, guardianship is fine as a system, but just not for her. And the reality is that everyone deserves the right to make their own decisions. And there's a lot of reasons why people get placed under guardianship. But no matter the reason or the specific disability or the specific support needs that someone has, they deserve to have dignity and self-determination. And there are so many alternatives to guardianship that provide people with what they need to do that without losing their basic rights. Yes, 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 yes. I feel like every time I hear you talk, I'm like, wow, one, I learned something. One, I feel so fired up and like ready to take to the streets. But I mean, this is your work, right? This is what you've spend your a lot of your career doing and I'm wondering kind of what your personal slash professional thoughts were when all of this was kind of coming to light with Britney Spears and seeing people suddenly pretend to be armchair you know conservatorship experts on Twitter and you know making demands and, and showing a lot of support for her but in a way that um, maybe wasn't always so helpful so what you know what was going through your head when we've seen this kind of slow roll throughout the past couple decade and a half well, I think it was a really watershed moment um, in many ways. Like, I think it was really 
eye-opening um, for a lot of people because so many people didn't realize how common guardianship was. And what was unusual about Brittany's situation wasn't that she was under guardianship, but it was that she had that platform to share her story. And there was public outcry and news coverage about guardianship uh, and her guardianship in particular. Um, and it was still hard for her to share her stories. It took years, but that's still far more opportunity than most people under guardianship have. Um, most people who are under guardianship face so many barriers to sharing their stories. And in many cases, they're actively isolated and prevented from doing that. And that really opens up the door to even greater abuse of their rights. So Brittany's case was one of those like rare moments where someone who is currently under guardianship was able to speak out and get public attention and ultimately get out of guardianship. Um, I guess one of the things that really stood out for a lot of people was the fact that her father, as her conservator, effectively prevented her from removing her IUD. And there was a lot of outcry around that, especially since she wanted to get pregnant but wasn't able to um, because of what her conservator was doing. And what shocked a lot of people wasn't just that it happened, but it was perfectly legal. Because as I mentioned, guardians have these incredibly sweeping powers. They might be able to make decisions about your health care, including your reproductive care, including by forcing you to use birth control that you don't want to use, or it can mean preventing you from using birth control that you want to use, preventing you from getting an abortion that you want. So guardianship is very much a reproductive rights and justice issue. And I think that that Britney's experience highlighted that. We obviously have had some really public stories that have brought light to this problem and issue in the United States. You know, we have Britney Spears, like we said. And, you know, I'm thinking of Michael Orr, this person whose story inspired The Blind Side, has spoken up and said that he was under conservatorship as well. And you've talked about kind of the harm and the negative connotation that these stories bring to light. I'm wondering, in your kind of dream world, what would the conservatorship system look like in our country? So just speaking um, for myself, I think that in, in my dream world, there would be no guardianship and no conservatorship or, or maybe guardianship used in exceedingly rare and very, very limited situations because there are so many better alternatives. So for example, there's um, something called supported decision-making. Um, where a disabled person can choose individuals who can help them weigh their options, understand their options, uh, communicate their desires. But ultimately, the disabled person is the one who is making the final decision. So they're getting the supports that they need in order to exercise their autonomy and exercise their rights. So with so many better alternatives to guardianship, there's really no good reason why we should be preserving this incredibly flawed system. Um, I think that we should be moving to a massive overhaul of the system and moving instead to things like supported decision making. Yeah, I had no idea that that was even an option because I feel like that's a big kind of talking point for folks when we talk about, you know, we've quote unquote freed Britney, right? And then she does post something on Instagram that people do not like or don't think is normal, quote, or um, something that a, you know, a sane person would do. And it's like, but that doesn't mean you should not have control over your body, right? There's there's still this thinking, this way of thinking in this um almost like stereotype that people have in their brain over who gets to be controlled and and why you should all of a sudden just get that taken away from you. And so it's nice to know that there are ways that people can be supported, like you said, with still their own autonomy intact. Right. And there is dignity to being able to have autonomy to make mistakes. Um, so sometimes disabled people make decisions that other people don't agree with. Obviously, non-disabled people make decisions that others don't agree with as well. Um, but when disabled people are making those decisions that other people don't agree with, then it's used as a basis for saying, well, they shouldn't have the right to control their life at all. Um, they should have those decision-making powers being taken away. And there is much less room for um, grace and recognition that to err is human. There's dignity in being able to make mistakes is 
like shout that from the rooftops. I feel like that's put that on a shirt that I feel like sums up exactly why this is all so, so messed up. Um, You mentioned the supportive decision making as a much better, more dignified avenue to help folks who want support, but to maintain autonomy. I'm wondering, is there any like protection that folks who may be at risk to being put under a conservatorship have is, you know, Brittany we've talked about has pretty much endless resources. And even with her, like you said, it took, I think, 13 years. Um, and that's such a long time. Is there any way folks can protect themselves from the outset or are there steps people can take to kind of prevent that or to support themselves in different ways? Well, there are, in every state, um, organizations called Protection and Advocacy Agencies, or PNA agencies. They're supposed to provide disabled people with help in those kinds of situations. Um, so if their rights are being abused, if they're being neglected, if they are um, f- potentially facing a guardianship issue... Unfortunately, in terms of like the actual protections that exist on the court level, then those are very, very inadequate. So people are often just sort of funneled into guardianship. Um, The judge might just say, well, because this person is disabled or because this person's um, potential guardian is claiming that they don't have the decision-making ability, I'm just going to assume that they don't have that ability and just sign off on the guardianship. Um, And it's very hard for a lot of people to find that point of intervention where they can stop the guardianships from happening. And once someone is under guardianship, then it can be really, really hard to get help and get out of guardianship. Um, Courts often just sort of uh, defer to the guardian um, on what the disabled person might need and might not give the disabled person very much of an opportunity to um, speak out and to demand that their rights be respected and to also demand that their autonomy be restored. It's very hard to do what Britney Spears did and get out of guardianship. So in addition to overhauling the guardianship system as a whole, there's a lot to do with um, reforming the guardianship system to improve some of those rights along the way. But um, improving procedural rights in itself is not enough. We, We need to do that bigger overhaul. Yeah, I mean, what you talked about with the system and folks just kind of being forced into a lifelong conservatorship or a really, really long time, unfortunately, is so common in so many kind of predatory systems we have in our country, right? You Once you get in, it's so hard to get out. And um, so many times folks at the center of those systems, folks taking on and getting the most harm put onto them are not being centered in the conversations around how to overhaul those systems and how they want to be best helped. So I'm wondering if you have advice or um, wisdom you can impart on us and how to best advocate for people with disabilities and people under conservatorships or at risk for conservatorship. How can we support them and make sure that they're being centered and listened to? I think that the most important thing is to follow the leadership of disabled people and make sure that disabled people have the opportunity to show that leadership, to share their stories, to share their perspectives, because both when it comes to guardianship laws and to forced sterilization laws, disabled people have really had to fight for the power to say to the world, like, hey, this is happening and it has to change. You know, it can be a real struggle to not just make people aware of these laws, but then to realize that these laws aren't necessary, they aren't justified, they aren't protective um, because of this pervasive assumption that disabled people or some disabled people can't or shouldn't be making their own decisions, that other people need to make those decisions for us. So it's about making sure that when disabled people are calling for action, then people listen and people respect what they have to say. Because we know that these assumptions that these laws are based on are wrong, they're dangerous, they've been used for years to justify the coercion and abuse of disabled people. And the reality is that disabled people are trying to share that when we are empowered, when we are supported, we can make our own decisions, we have every right to, and policy should follow that. 
Maya, and I'm so lucky to get to know you and to work with you. Um, your report is awesome. Like I said, we will link it in the show notes. We are so lucky as a community and a world to have amazing people like you fighting for the good fight. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much to Mayan for joining us on Hearsay. That was such an important conversation. If you felt like your eyes were opened as much as mine were, I hope you check out their report, which is linked in our show notes. Hearsay is a Wonder Media Network production in partnership with the National Women's Law Center. It is hosted and produced by Jessica Baskerville, Lark Lewis, and Hillary Woodward. Our producers are Taylor Williamson and Autumn Harris. Jenny Kaplan is our executive producer, and Maddie Foley is our editor. Production assistance by Lucy Jones and show art by Andrea Sumner. Thanks so much for listening. Oh, we are, we are, we are. You are now, now rocking with, with I am Britney, bitch.